Tonight on Levin TV, written out of history. Who wrote this? Senator Lee, come on over. By Senator Mike Lee. Episode one, there'll be two episodes in a far-reaching discussion, outstanding book. This is where freedom rings. If you believe in America, if you believe in the Constitution, the Constitution empowers us. It's a new day. America's back. America's back and America's gonna get strong again. We're gonna defend America and we're gonna defend our interests. Liberty's Voice, Levin TV. Hello America, I'm Mark Levin. This is Levin TV on Conservative Review TV, our conservative network. I'm here with a dear friend of mine, the conscience of the Senate, Mike Lee. How are you, sir? Doing great, thank you. It's a pleasure. Pleasure is mine. And I'm here to talk about this with him. This is an outstanding new book. You Levinites out there, history, the Constitution, and so forth. I know that interests you a great deal. Let's start from the beginning. And I want to talk about some current events, too, and we'll work, in, work it into the book. This is a substantial book. Why did you decide to write it, and how did you write it, given your schedule and so forth? It's in part because of my schedule that I decided to write it. It's part of what I do so as not to go insane in the Senate. It's a way of channeling my energy. So uh, a lot of weekends, uh, recess times, long airplane flights. Those are all things I have access to. And I decided to write it because I think there are stories the American people need to know. It's one thing to tell them about what the Constitution says. It's another thing to tell them about what I think is the reason certain parts of the Constitution exist. But it makes a much bigger difference if they know the stories behind the people who wrote it and the people who otherwise influenced it. By the way, how long is that flight from Washington to Utah? It's about four hours. Four hours. It varies a little bit depending on which direction, but yeah, it tends to be about four hours. And I, I suspect you knew a lot of this already, and you probably dug in to get the scholarship, correct? Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, 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 there are some things that, uh, that I knew already. There are other things that I discovered while writing it. But the important part of it is to, to make sure that people understand that the founding fathers are, are not just those who attended the convention necessarily. There are other founders, who, uh, some of whom uh, uh, most Americans have never heard of whose stories they need to understand, because when they understand their stories, they understand the Constitution. Now, you were a clerk. Yes. Who did you clerk for? I clerked for Justice Alito uh, on the Supreme Court. I learned a tremendous amount from him. He's a strong believer in the Constitution, strong believer in liberty, and he's, he's a phenomenal human being and a wonderful Supreme Court justice. Can I tell you a little story about Sam Alito? Yeah. He worked in the Reagan uh, uh, Justice Department, the solicitor's office. And he was the principal deputy. And Charles Freed, who was our solicitor, and was actually quite liberal, um, Sam Alito decided he wanted to be a political appointee. He'd been a career appointee. And so I was, obviously, for the attorney general, Ed Meese, his chief of staff, and I handled these things. And I looked at his resume, and I said, well, he doesn't have the political background. So I called him in, and I interviewed him. And I said, put a memo together for me. So he put a memo together on why he's a conservative and what he had done and so forth. And I sent it to the White House to get him cleared, and they resisted. And then I picked up the phone. I said, clear him. The attorney general said. So they cleared him. And he got a political position. And that memo <laughs> came up during his hearings. I'm just saying, that, that's my experience. And he's a wonderful man, as you're right. He's a brilliant man. He's a soft-spoken man. And on the court, don't you agree? He's done an outstanding job. I mean, I know you were his clerk, but I mean, he's shown absolute fidelity to the Constitution, don't you think? Absolutely, without question. And you know, in, in approaching each case, his focus was always on the text. Let's figure out what the text says. Let's uh, figure out what the, whether it's a statute or a provision of the Constitution, figure out what it says. And that is exactly what the role of the judge should be, to decide what the law is rather than to decide what the law should be, as some might wish it to be as a matter of policy. And what does a clerk do exactly on the Supreme Court? A Supreme Court law clerk serves uh, uh, basically three main purposes. One is to assist the justice in deciding which cases are going to come up for review. Uh, to the Supreme Court, making recommendations on what we call but petitions you get for thousands rights of certiorari. Them, right? Yeah, when I was there, there were roughly 10,000 cases uh, where there were parties uh, that wanted re review in the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court heard fewer than 100 per year. Uh, 
So the winnowing down uh, of the winnowing process in that uh, depends to some degree on the clerks who review the petitions and make recommendations. The clerks also prepare the justice for oral argument, uh, proposing uh, questions and things like that that might be asked. And then the, the clerks also assist the justice in drafting opinions uh, uh, that the justice might be working on. Now, you interact with other clerks. Do you ever interact with other justices? Yes. Um, during any particular year of a Supreme Court clerkship, each justice has four clerks. And each group of four clerks will take every other justice to lunch at one point or another during that year. And that makes for some interesting conversation, especially, uh, uh, well, they're all fascinating people. Uh, I, I really enjoyed each of those encounters. I remember, in particular, a very lengthy series of conversations I had with Justice Breyer over lunch, uh, in which we exchanged uh, some very frank views on matters of constitutional interpretation. I also remember that uh, with Justice Ginsburg, she prefers to have the other law clerks come into her chambers for tea. One of my co-clerks spilled the teapot and did so right in front of me, made it look like it was my fault. <laughs> I was terribly embarrassed. And was she okay about that? Yes, yes, she, <clears throat> she, she, she didn't scold me. And it's interesting, uh, people say that uh, Ginsburg and Scalia were friends. Were they friends? Yes, they were dear friends. They traveled together uh, with their respective spouses. They uh, enjoyed doing things together socially. Even though they were at opposite ends of the political spectrum, the ideological spectrum, the spectrum as far as how you interpret a statute or a provision of the Constitution, they were dear friends. You know, uh, Scalia, I mean, that really is a big hole on that court, isn't it? Huge loss. Mm -hmm. I, I remember uh, uh, vividly the moment I found <coughs> out that he had passed. It, it was a, a, a real loss for this country. It's depressing. It was, yeah. and especially because he, you know, he affected, he was on the court for almost 30 years. He affected an entire generation, and the way an entire generation would view the law and the Constitution, not just with respect to judging. He revolutionized the way the American people look at the law and the Constitution and the way they go about it in, in a whole variety of contexts. He's, he's influenced a, an entire new generation of lawyers and judges who, regardless of their political views, approach the law differently than they would have without you know, Scalia being on the Supreme Court. The Senate confirmation process has become a complete disaster. And um, the Democrats took it to the brink this time. And so you Republicans had to stand up in order to get a vote for Neil Gorsuch, who is perfectly qualified. He's not even considered provocative by, by the left standards. Have we reached a point now that anybody who supports the text the original meaning of the Constitution, the left will oppose. It would appear that way, especially when you look at Judge Gorsuch's background. You look at his record. I mean, I, I reviewed more Gorsuch opinions from the Tenth Circuit than I can possibly count. And I couldn't find a bad one among them, nor could I find one that should have necessarily been all that controversial. Uh, because his approach was to say, here's what the law says. Uh, let's discern its meaning in this circumstance. That was his approach. That is not a radical thing. At least it should not be radical. And yet they opposed it. If I can say another thing yep. on, on that confirmation process, I, I actually think that w what happened with Justice Gorsuch's confirmation, uh, what people referred to as the, the nuclear option, um, lowering the threshold for bringing debate to a close on a nominee, that had actually happened back in November of 2013. The Democrats purported at the time to be carving out an exception for the Supreme Court. My own personal view is that they went nuclear. They, they brought the threshold down to 51 back in November of 2013. This was just a logical application of that. Mm -hmm. it, it, some in the Senate disagreed with me, and that's why we ended up having an additional vote on that. But my view is the die was cast in 2013. Again, for me, in order to understand this book and why you wrote this book, a little bit more about you. You fought the system. You fought the Republican establishment to get the nomination for the United States Senate. Explain how that happened. Back in 2009, I started thinking a lot about what was happening in Washington. It bothered me. It bothered me that uh, there were a lot of people, including people within my own political party and the Republican Party, who were serving, who were not remembering the Constitution, not remembering the fact that the federal government's supposed to be one with powers that are few and defined, and those reserved to the states, numerous and indefinite. About that same time, 
I happened to stumble across a book, you may have heard of it, That's right. called Liberty and Tyranny. And I stumbled across it uh, one day. I had just gotten a, a, a Kindle. Uh, there were no tablets back then, but I had a <clears throat> brand new Kindle. And I was looking for something to download on my Kindle. And it may be that the first book I ever bought electronically was Liberty and Tyranny. Really? And I, I stumbled across it. I thought, this looks interesting. I'll take a look at it. I couldn't put it down. I had never found something that, that so closely aligned with my political ideology and at the same time taught me so much. Um, I ended up giving a lot of speeches in which I invoked a lot of themes brought up in that book. And those speeches ended up turning into a U.S. Senate can campaign. I, I ended up running against a three-term incumbent for my own party. Robert Bennett. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I won. Uh, and defying. you had a convention process in your time. Yes, we, had, we have a, a caucus and convention process preceding a primary. It's a complicated process. It works well for us. And how old were you? I was uh, 39 when I was elected to the Senate. So when I first got here to Washington, I was the youngest member of the Senate. So you went from no political office to the United States Senate. You truly are a citizen senator. Yes. I had never held political office previously. I had never run for political office uh, previously. And so uh, I got into this because of my love for the Constitution. That's uh, uh, something that uh, we discussed around the dinner table uh, when I was a kid. It's something I've focused on as an attorney my entire career. And I didn't expect to run for the United States Senate at that stage of life, if ever. But the opportunity came along, and I did it, prompted in part by thank liberty you. and tyranny. Well, so very thank kind. you. And then he met me, and he said, oh, Anyway, so let, let me ask you this. Again, just so everybody knows. Your father was Rex Lee. He was Ronald Reagan's choice to be Solicitor of the United States at the Justice Department. Tell us a little about your father. My dad served as Ronald Reagan's first Solicitor General. And the job of the Solicitor General, of course, is to represent the US government in front of the Supreme Court. Uh, the Solicitor General wears a, a ceremonial uh, uh, uniform, so to speak, called a morning suit with long tails and pinstripe pants. I used to be kind of embarrassed of his suit when I went to the court with him, but I started going to the court with him when I was about 10 years old, mostly because it was a good excuse to miss school. But uh, as I continued to attend argument sessions with him at the court, I was intrigued by government. I started to understand little by little what was happening, and it caused me to be fascinated in our constitutional system. My dad was a good man. He was a strong believer in the Constitution. He taught us about federalism uh, from the time we learned how to talk and taught us that uh, it is uh, absolutely essential to our liberty and to uh, a system of public accountability to allow people to have local self-government. Separation of powers in federalism. To me, there are other strengths in the Constitution, but to me, those are the key principles. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. If there's one thing my father taught me from a young age, it's that, that there are these two structural protections that themselves are probably more important than any other single feature of the Constitution. He, he said that one uh, operates on the vertical axis, that is federalism, and the other operates on the horizontal axis, that is separation of powers. And when you put those two together, that provides a greater bulwark against tyranny and a greater support for liberty than just about anything else we could conceive of. And that to the extent we've had problems in our system of government, it has been the result of a deviation from federalism and separation of powers. And how healthy are those two principles right now? They've been weakened badly over the last 80 years. In fact, we've gone to the point now, you know, Madison described the federal government as uh, one with powers that are few and defined, and those reserved to the states numerous and indefinite. We flipped that principle on its head. Uh, you, you can almost uh, not find areas that the federal government doesn't currently touch. And then uh, with separation of powers, we've got one branch that makes the laws, another that interprets them, another that enforces them. Well, the branch that's enforcing them, the executive branch, is now all also making most of the law. Not just because they went on a wild hair and decided to do that. There's some of that too, but because members of Congress have voluntarily relinquished that power to the executive branch, deliberately passing the buck mm -hmm. and the political accountability that goes with it onto unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats. And this is, it's not a fair question, but I'll ask it anyway. Maybe complicated. So how do we fix this? Is it fixable? It is fixable. I'm convinced that it is. 
Look, I, I believe in something that Winston Churchill said, the American people can always be counted on to do the right thing after they've exhausted every other alternative. It's why I wrote this book, because I believe it can be fixed. I wrote Written Out of History because I think if people understand the historical context of the Constitution, including uh, the stories of some of these forgotten founders whose stories I, I tell in here, they'll be able to inject things like federalism and separation of powers back into our national political dialogue. Mm -hmm. The problem we have with it right now is that too few people are even familiar with these concepts or they're scared away perhaps uh, by the names themselves, uh, federalism and separation of powers. The words to some might sound intimidating. But when they learn the stories behind them, when they understand that federalism uh, came to us in part because, because of Canasetego, uh, the Iroquois chief who, who taught this principle of federalism to Benjamin Franklin, who in turn uh, uh, worked that principle into the Articles of Confederation and, and later the Constitution. Well, let's, let's talk about that. Tell us about this, this individual. Okay, so w when we think of our system of government, we think of it as being the, the natural outgrowth of, of a European system, of the English parliamentary system with some modifications. In some respects, that's true. And we think of the political philosophers who influenced it as uh, being people like uh, Charles de Montesquieu uh, and, and John Locke, and there's some truth to that too. But really, we ought to give more credit to Canasetego and other Native Americans. Canasetego was- I a, never heard of him before. It, it, most people have it. Yeah. Uh, he was an Iroquois Indian chief who uh, got to know Benjamin Franklin back in the 1740s. And uh, they developed this longtime friendship. And uh, Benjamin Franklin came to understand of how the Iroquois nations had come together. These six nations had come together and they understood that just as you, know, you take an arrow, it's easy to break one by itself. You bind six of them together, mm. it's much harder to break. They decided that they were going to govern themselves as a nation for certain limited purposes, especially for their own defense against other tribes who would want to go to war with them. But they distinctly left local autonomy up to each tribe. That was essential to the many centuries long uh, existence and peace and prosperity that the Iroquois nation earned. Mm -hmm. And how long did they keep up this association? They kept up the association uh, through the end of Canasetego's life. And even more importantly, this knowledge of the Iroquois Confederacy and how it worked remained with Benjamin Franklin throughout the rest of his life. He tried for uh, many decades to communicate this message. Ultimately, after the revolution, he was able to work it into the Articles of Confederation. And this unique relationship, Franklin and Canasego? Canasetego. Canasetego. Did Franklin ever share it with the other framers, or the other founders? Oh, yes, yes. He, he, he talked about it, he talked about the Iroquois and, and how he had gotten to know Canasetego and how their system of government worked. So sometimes we think of our, our modern system of federalism as being based on the Swiss cantons. In some ways it was, uh, but in, in other ways it was also based on the Iroquois. And having multiple examples to draw from uh, really helped in terms of setting up this system of federalism. This was relatively unique at the time. Mm -hmm. It's a relatively American innovation. And like so many other things that are uniquely American, it has its roots in Native Americans who were here long before European settlers arrived. And yet the progressive movement, among other things, but particularly this area, has targeted it. Federalism. They want a centralized power. They want uniform rules. <clears throat> Whereas you have federal departments and agencies today that are more powerful than the states, right? Right, right, exactly. And <clears throat> one of the ways in which they uh, attack it is, first of all, they, they'll refer to it through the uh, uh, reference to states' rights. There are a couple of reasons why I think they do this. Uh, number one, uh, it has a certain George Wallace feel to it. it, harkens back to an unfortunate era where federalism was abused in order to accomplish some bad things. Uh, but when they do this, uh, when, when they say that, that federalism is bad because it was sometimes used to do bad things, well, so has the federal government. Mm -hmm. The federal government has itself uh, been abused in order to accomplish bad purposes. The federal government itself uh, facilitated and perpetuated slavery for a long time and a whole lot of other bad things as well. The fact that something is abused through government should not be surprising. What's important about federalism uh, is that it is politically agnostic. It's neither uh, Republican nor Democratic. It's neither liberal nor conservative. 
the other problem that their reference to that overlooks in calling it states' rights, it's not the states that have rights, it's the individual. It's individual liberty that we seek to protect when we do this. That's why I don't ever refer to it as a states' rights issue. It's a federalism issue. Mm -hmm. It's the right of an individual to be governed by the appropriate level of government, to have the appropriate decision maker be involved. Mm -hmm. No, I think this is a very, very important point. And um, you can also, at least theoretically, influence the government, the more local it is. But the other point is, if they do something in Massachusetts you don't like, you don't have to live in Massachusetts. That's exactly right. People can vote with their feet. And they do, and, and they are. And they do. It was always intended to create a, a sort of competitive system, one in which states could compete in the marketplace of ideas. And if one state figured out something that worked really well, that state was going to benefit as a result. Other states would follow if they chose that thing. But the, the magic of federalism, and the point that I make in this book and in my last book, has been that more people in America would get more of the kind of government they want and less of the kind of government they don't want if we followed federalism. It's easier to turn around a personal watercraft, a jet ski, than it is an aircraft carrier. Mm -hmm. Well, the federal government is the aircraft carrier in that analogy. It's very difficult to turn around. That is not to say that local governments always make the right decision. Sometimes they make exactly the wrong decision, mm -hmm. but they're easier to turn around. They're more responsive to the people. They can be changed more quickly. That's good for individual liberty. And as a parallel point, do you agree with what the late Milton Friedman said, that the more, the more the government gets involved in decisions, uh, the more divided the country is? Because when you have these diffused decisions, diffused decisions, make, you don't have to make compromises, you don't have to work out deals, and there, there's not a party that feels that they're lost, a political party or some group or some entity, which is the great the great aspect of having these decisions made in the private sector by individuals as much as possible, whereas the federal government, like Obamacare, you know, awful lot of people despise it. An awful lot of people are not benefited by it. A small percentage, maybe. And uh, his point is, well, not only is it bad, but it divides the country. Do you agree with that? Absolutely, I do. And that's one of the reasons why we so badly need Federalism. It's one of the reasons why I, did, I dedicated a, a, a chapter to talking about Elbridge Gerry. Elbridge Let's Gerry talk was, about him. him I'm from, he I'm familiar with. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, so uh, Elbridge Gerry uh, was a big believer in federalism and a, a big protector of individual liberty as well. Elbridge Gerry proposed a version of what became the Tenth Amendment that would have been a little more aggressive. It would have said all power is not expressly granted to Congress. And he believed that, and He's right. he was absolutely right. James Madison, unfortunately, made the decision to remove the word expressly from that sentence. So what became the 10th Amendment was uh, something that gave the federal government a little bit more play in the joints. Now, at the time he made the decision, and for about 150 years after that, federalism was still protected because we followed it, we understood it. But starting about 150 years after that amendment was put in place, we started to drift away from it, to the point now where we've almost rendered the Tenth Amendment ineffective. We've almost nullified it uh, from a practical standpoint. But once people understand that this is already part of our Constitution, and it's part of the history of the Constitution, part of what those who helped form the Constitution, like Elbridge Gerry, saw, once they know the stories behind it, mm -hmm. they can help restore the principle of federalism. As to Obamacare, this is a great example of where federalism ought to come into play. I have it on good authority that a majority of the people in Vermont would much prefer a single-payer, government-run, government-funded health care system. Now, this is one of the reasons why I'm not likely to move to Vermont. Mm -hmm. uh, but look, if the people of Vermont want that, I say let them do it. They could do it, and they could go there a lot more effectively, efficiently, quickly, if the federal government weren't occupying so much of the field of health care already. Now, people in other states, say Utah, where I live, would never go for that. There are also vast differences, not just uh, uh, in political ideology uh, and economics and how people view their relationship with government, but also with things like how health care is delivered and how much it costs. These things vary dramatically from one state to another. So in light of those differences, it makes no sense to create a single national system 
whether it's Obamacare or a national single-payer system or something akin to that. It makes no difference at all for this even to be a federal issue. Sure, I'm fine if, if we come up with a few regulations that can make things somewhat consistent so that the, there aren't too many differences, so that there's not too much uncertainty when someone wants to uh, move from state to state or when someone wants to purchase uh, health insurance across state lines. There is a limited federal role to play there. But the federal government should never be in the business of just occupying the entire field. So why don't most Republicans in Congress believe this? They do. They've all campaigned on that. We have all campaigned for the last seven years on the fact that... But they don't do anything. What, well, it, that remains to be seen. And that's one of the things I've been pushing for. We do have to repeal Obamacare. Having campaigned for seven years on how bad Obamacare is, on how much it has escalated the cost of health care, we now have to actually repeal it. It is a great frustration to me, though, that we don't hear as many of the arguments as we had during previous well, stages of those seven senator years. who said the other day, and I won't put you on the spot, but one senator said the other day, it's not going to happen this year. I, I just completely disagree, uh, and, and, and I wonder, I, I'm actually not sure which one you're referring to, but I, I wonder North about Carolina. what that person meant and why that person can be so sure that nothing is going to happen. Now, the American people elected uh, President Trump and elected a Republican Senate and elected a Republican House of Representatives with the understanding that the biggest single thing that would be different if we were elected would be that we would repeal Obamacare. We repealed Obamacare, uh, as much of it as we believed we could at the time, in December of 2015. We submitted that to President Obama, who vetoed it. Why should we pass anything less aggressive toward repealing Obamacare now than we did then? Well, you're quite right, but you have a small percentage of Republicans who voted that way when they didn't think it would be signed and won't vote that way now. So it's very, very cynical, at least in that regard. Give us a little bit of background about Gary. Elbridge Gary was a delegate to the Constitutional Convention. He was from Marblehead, Massachusetts. He was a, a good man. He was a man who cared deeply about his country. He was a man who was... Uh, uh, deeply uh, ethical. Uh, he, he would uh, oppose certain actions to be taken by government even when they might inure to his own economic interest if they conflicted with what he believed uh, would be in the interest of the people as a whole and if he believed they would degrade liberty. Uh, he had some concerns about the Constitution, especially the Constitution prior to the Bill of Rights. It's one of the reasons why he expressed those concerns and uh, w one of the reasons why his recommendations about how the Constitution should be changed are still very valid today. One of the things I love about Albert Gary that I talk about a little bit in my book is he raised some concerns specifically with regard to the power that Congress would have over federal public land. Uh, what we now call the Enclave Clause, Clause 17 of Article 1, Section 8, gives Congress vast power to control federal public land, to be basically the sole sovereign lawmaking body over that land. In response to his concerns, he said, look, um, this was in September of 1787, toward the end of the convention. He said, the federal government could one day purchase a whole bunch of land in a particular state and use this immense power that we proposed in the Enclave Clause to uh, compel those states to a humble obedience to the general government. In response to that, they put some language in there that said that that power would exist only where the land was purchased by the consent of a host state's legislature. That language, alas, has been uh, largely ignored, and that's one of the reasons why in states like mine, where the federal government owns two-thirds of the land, we have become beholden to federal land, make, uh, federal land managers, a small handful of government bureaucrats in Washington, control most of the land in my state. If we had listened more closely to Elbridge Gary and the concerns he raised, we wouldn't be in that position. And yet it's, it's controversial, not to me, but it's controversial apparently, if a candidate even suggests that big chunks of these lands should be given back to the states. Yes, it's regarded as controversial because, again, they, they like the consolidation of power. They want all government, they, they want more things generally to be government decisions, and they want virtually all government decisions to be federal. Now, this shouldn't be the case because I, I, there's actually a lot of evidence suggesting that the states can manage public land in a more environmentally sensible fashion, in, in a manner that protects the various interests at stake. Whether and there's they're, a lot of evidence the feds can't. And a lot of evidence that the feds can't because they don't, because they manage it very badly.
And uh, nonetheless, uh, progressives tend to want to consolidate everything, including land management in the federal government. Now, you have an individual in your book who viewers of this program have some general familiarity with, George Mason. Why did you include him in your book? George Mason was a very unconventional uh, founding father. He was a delegate to the Constitutional Convention. He was a reluctant one. He was a businessman first and foremost. He wanted to be home with his family, and he wanted to be running his business. He didn't want to be there in Philadelphia, and he didn't want to be getting involved in politics. Uh, but he did it because he loved his country, and he expressed grave reservations with the Constitution, uh, ultimately voting against it because of the fact that he didn't think it did enough to protect liberty. This is a man whose, uh, whose legacy lives on, definitely in Virginia, but many Americans are not as familiar with him, and that's why I tell his story in this book. And um, tell us a little bit about his story. He, he, he opposed slavery, but he owned some slaves. He, um, he, he was an influential voice at the Constitutional Convention. And uh, he was friends with Washington, lived near Washington, but he opposed the Constitution, and so Washington was furious with him. Yes. Right? Yes. And that was quite a Virginia convention, wasn't it? You had Patrick Henry standing up against it. You had, and they had quite a convention in Massachusetts, right? I mean, the ratification almost didn't make it in Massachusetts and Virginia. That's exactly And New York, as a matter of fact. That's exactly right. You, you, you mentioned slavery yeah. and George Mason's approach to that, and it's counterintuitive uh, for many people when they learn that you had George Mason, a slaveholder, who spoke out against slavery, calling it a, a, you know, a scourge of, of sorts, something that would bring the judgment of, of God upon this country and something that was wrong and would, would lead to all kinds of problems and was itself immoral and re repugnant to the conscience. He was joined in this by Luther Martin, uh, who, who, also in who was, is also in the book. Mm -hmm. Luther Martin and George Mason were both slaveholders, and they both opposed slavery and did so openly uh, at the convention and in the ratifying process. They did so in a way that I think most people would find surprising, because most people would think, okay, slaveholders would automatically be opposed to anything that brought the subject up. Uh, but uh, Luther Martin and George Mason were not afraid to do this. In fact, they understood that it was absolutely necessary, even though it made things awkward there. They understood that this was something that had been put into place uh, uh, many centuries before they came along and would end up being a problem if the new republic uh, got off on the wrong foot, which it would do by perpetuating slavery. And so how do you answer particularly leftists, who say, well, they were hypocrites. You know, it's one thing to be opposed to slavery. It's another thing to own slaves. They were kind of stuck, weren't they, from an economic perspective, where they inherited slaves in the, in the family. I'm not, make, I'm not defending. I'm not making excuses. But, you know, Lincoln addressed this, right? Yes. <clears throat> in 1858 with, um, in the, in the Lincoln-Douglas debate. And he would always point to the Declaration of Independence. And he would always say, these men did what they could do, and then they left it to their progeny to, to resolve the rest of it. He says, read the Declaration of Independence. It says nothing about race, unalienable rights, all human beings, every individual. And he praised them over and over and over again. And there he is, the, the, you know, the, the president during the Civil War, trying to explain that those, those principles and values that are eternal, that are expressed in the Declaration of Independence, right? <clears throat> Mason and the others embraced and promoted. That all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Right. Uh, the, the, these were things that echoed down through the generations and they firmly believed them. There were among the founding generation uh, those who understood that this was wrong and they actually did try. That's why I, I push back against those who describe men like George Mason and Luther Martin as hypocrites. They were trying to end it against their own interests, against their, uh, the economic interests of their families, of their businesses, and of those immediately surrounding them. They tried to stop it, and they understood that it would create problems, and we should revere them for that. This, by the way, ties into what we talk about in another chapter of this book, when I tell I the story of Mum Bet. You have Mum Bet, another person I never heard of before. Who's Mum Bet? Mum Bet was a slave. She was a slave in the household of Colonel John Ashley. A Massachusetts state judge. 
uh, Colonel Ashley was involved in some early discussions, uh, what became known as the Sheffield Declaration, which in turn uh, was worked in in a slightly different form to the Massachusetts State Constitution of 1780. And in that declaration, it acknowledged that, that all human beings are free and equal in a state of nature and in the eyes of God. Mumbet was there in the Ashley residence as a slave when those words were originally written. When they became part of the Massachusetts State Constitution, which John Adams wrote, she thought about it and she thought, if in fact all human beings are free and equal in the eyes of God and in the eyes of the law now, then I should be free. Mm -hmm. And so she went to a man named Sedgwick, who had also been present in, in the Ashley home for the drafting of the Sheffield Declaration, and retained him as her lawyer. And he took this case all the way up to the highest court in the state of Massachusetts. She won her freedom. She did so under state law. Now, this is one of my big pushbacks to any who would argue that state law, giving states uh, authority, uh, autonomy, to regulate their own internal affairs is somehow hostile to the rights of human beings, hostile to the little guy. Quite the opposite of true is true. Look at the Massachusetts State Constitution. Mm -hmm. This resulted in the, the first freeing of slaves in America that we have record of as a legal matter. And Mumbet sees this moment. Mumbet was an early American hero, and she was an African-American woman. We owe her a debt of gratitude. I hope you enjoyed the first episode. There's two of my interview with Mike Lee and his great book, Written Out of History. Check out episode two tomorrow.